My father tells of a story when he was in ninth grade and an assignment that he was given. In six weeks' time, he was to write an autobiography of himself, his life up to that point. In typical youthful fashion, he put it off until literally the last minute, the period before it was due. I believe somebody said, hey, did you finish that assignment? And he said, what assignment? <laughs> so he hurriedly threw together his life story, and the paper began this way. In the beginning, I was quite young. <laughs> As time passed, I grew older. <laughs> Profound, huh? Now you know where I get it. <laughs> but I want to ask you, if you were given such an assignment, where would you start with your life story? Would it be with the day of your birth and the details surrounding that event? I like what John Stott has to say on this. He says, the most formative influence on each of us is our parents and our home. Hence, good biographies never begin with their subject, but with the parents, and probably the grandparents as well. Certainly, this was the case of a young man who played an important role in the early years of Christianity. His name was Timothy. He was a close associate of the Apostle Paul. But his story doesn't begin with him. It begins with his mother, and his grandmother. In the fifth verse of the opening chapter of 2 Timothy, Paul writes, I have been reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded now lives in you also. At a time when women were not often highly regarded or even named publicly, Paul names both Timothy's mother and grandmother and commends them for their faith and their faithfulness, which they had passed on to young Timothy. There is a classic hymn that's in our Red hymnal, Faith of Our Fathers, written a long time ago. And then somebody came along a little later and wrote words to the same tune that's called Faith of Our Mothers. And it talks about the godly heritage. Those of us who are blessed enough to have Christian mothers. And what a blessing that truly is. So tonight I want to talk about faith of our mothers and grandmothers to see how important that role can be in the development of a child, how that will carry through their entire life. Paul held Lois and Eunice in the highest honor. And I believe we can see in these two women models for what mothers and grandmothers today and the role they can play in raising the next generation. Even though they lived 2,000 years ago and half a world away, they faced some of the same issues that folks face today. And I believe that their example can instruct and inspire us all. First thing I want to point out is their commitment of faith. We're actually first introduced to this family in Acts chapter 16 and verse 1. Now you won't find the names of the ladies here, but you do find a mention. Acts chapter 16, we see Paul on a missionary journey. And the first verse says... He came to Derby, and then to Lystra, where a disciple named Timothy lived, whose mother was a Jewess and a believer, but whose father was a Greek. She's not named here, but Timothy's mother, we know her name is Eunice from 2 Timothy, is described as being Jewish by birth, 
and Christian by choice. She was born into a Jewish family, and somewhere along the line, she married a Greek, a Gentile, which may not even have been her choice. Oftentimes, marriages were arranged back then, so she may not have had any say in the matter. If she did, it may indicate that she wasn't uh, always following the Jewish orthodoxy. If she was given in marriage, it may mean that her father was not a very uh, orthodox Jew. But at some point, she came to faith in Christ. Maybe it was around the same time that her mother, Lois, also came to know Jesus. And to understand that such conversions are not easy in that culture, even to this day, in that part of the world, to change religions is a dangerous thing. They don't take to it kindly. For a Jew, becoming a Christian often meant being disowned by your family and friends. And that would really be difficult for women in the first century because they would find it much harder to make a living on their own than they would in today's society. So their commitment to faith was costly. Their commitment to faith was also consistent. It's interesting, when Paul writes in 2 Timothy 1, he says, the faith has dwelled in Lois and Eunice. It wasn't there as an occasional visitor. <laughs> it wasn't there when it was convenient. It didn't, they didn't just show up at Christmas and Easter or Mother's Day. <clears throat> this was a faith that was a part of their life. It was a regular part of their practice. And it was a genuine faith. A faith that would have had to persevere under some difficult circumstances. And it was that kind of faith that Paul was certain had been implanted in Timothy as well. And he came to appreciate that. Apparently the adage, do as I say, not as I do, did not apply to the household of Lois and Eunice. They honored and revered God's word. And together, they brought up young Timothy, not only hearing the words, but seeing the life. This was a faith that was a life commitment for them both. I'm sure that they were familiar with the Old Testament passage in Deuteronomy chapter 6, beginning in verse 6. These commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts. Impress them on your children. I understand that today the culturally acceptable uh, mode in parenting is, well, we'll just let the children decide for themselves. We don't want to influence them too much, and so you know, we'll just let them figure it out that's not God's way. God says, I want you to take what I'm giving to you, take the truth that I'm revealing to you, and I want you to impress them on your children. Make an impression on them. Now, it is true, ultimately, they will choose. And, and I don't advocate shoving anything down someone's throat because it just doesn't work. <laughs> but you can make an impression, especially on a young child, in a positive way, by not only talking about your faith, but living it. Letting them see as well as hear what it means to be a follower of Jesus. That is going to leave an impression on them. In fact, that passage goes on to say how to do it. When you rise up, when you lie down, when you're walking along the road. Just as you go about your ordinary living, find opportunities where you can share the truth. And they don't have to be formal, okay, 
kids, we're going to sit down and learn about God. Now, this, you'd be driving down the road and, and see something that happens and, and share the truth that you know from, from the Scripture. Uh, just in your normal, ordinary existence, that's how you impress upon your children the truth of God's Word. And, and I believe that's what Lois and Eunice did. Later on, Paul wrote to Timothy in that same second letter, chapter 3, verse 15, he talks about the Holy Scriptures which make you wise for salvation and equipped for every good work. I don't believe it's ever too young to begin to talk to our children about God and about the truth of His Word. Now, we need to do it in an age-appropriate fashion. We don't want to talk over their heads and they don't get it. But there are ways of communicating our faith, even at a young age. Now, I know many of you might be sitting there saying, well, I don't have time to be a Bible scholar. You don't need to be. You don't need to be a Bible scholar. Just be a Bible student. We should all be learning more and more from God's Word and seeking to apply what we learn to our lives. That's something we should never outgrow. We should always be yearning for more. And if we can whet the appetites of our children so that they want to know more, so that they're asking questions and they're wondering about these things. That's a good thing. You say, well, I don't have the answer. That's all right. The fact that they're searching is going to compel them to dig a little deeper. <coughs> and, and that's a good thing. I like how the Women's Study Bible puts it. Eunice, Eunice and Lois are valuable models Women can know God's word and they can faithfully teach it to their children. Like Eunice and Lois, they can carefully nurture a true faith and be diligent to possess right doctrine. They can model for their children godliness rather than worldliness and Christ-likeness as opposed to self-centeredness. Eunice and Lois were living testimonies that nothing in a mother's life is more important than a personal and vibrant faith modeled before her children. Again, it's not dependent upon how much you know. It's how much of what you know do you live. Because, as the old adage goes, some lessons are better caught than taught. When they see it in our lives, when they can model after us, that's going to make that impression that God wants us to have on our children. Well, not only did they have a commitment of faith, Lois and Eunice communicated their faith. And they did it very effectively. And again, in that same letter, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 and 15, <coughs> Continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of because you know the those because you know those from whom you learned it and how from infancy you have known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus from infancy they were teaching Timothy by what they said, but also by what they did. They were able to communicate their faith. Now Paul mentions uh, sacred writings here, or, or the, yeah, the, the scriptures coming from a Jewish heritage. That would have been the Old Testament. That's all they would have had at that time. And passages like that one in Deuteronomy. You know, impress these on your children. That, that was their Bible. That's what they were to follow. And they helped build that faith in Timothy. 
They weren't content with their own knowledge of the scriptures. They imparted that knowledge on that child. And from the very earliest days, from infancy, you see this spiritual training begun. And I just, I don't think that can be overemphasized. We, we can't make too much out of this important principle. Two experts in the field of Christian education, Howard Hendricks and Kenneth Gangle, uh, write in a book they did together. The scriptures reveal that from the earliest days of God's people, the family has had more than simply a physiological and sociological purpose. The key element in the Bible for the family is educational. An element through which the child is brought to grips with the reality of God and his son Jesus Christ, as well as the ministry of the Holy Spirit. The child learns about God primarily in the context of his family and how he may know God through faith. In addition, the child learns how he should behave in society as a representative of God and of God's people. Parents enjoy the greatest privilege and at the same time bear the greatest responsibility for the spiritual education and development of their children. And this is so true in our culture today. We cannot expect somebody else to educate our children is when it comes to our faith. Sunday school, vacation Bible school, summer camps, these are all good. We should expose them to as many opportunities as we can. But there is no substitute for what I would call spiritual homeschooling. Now, homeschooling has become very popular. And whether you homeschool or send your kid to a private school or public school, spiritual homeschooling is something that can't be replicated anywhere else. And you're going to have the greatest impact on that child in the four walls of your home. Much more so than the teacher at church or a teacher at school. You are going to have the greatest impact. Now, I realize you will find there are some children that come from unbelieving homes, come from unbelieving parents, dysfunctional families, and they still turn out to be God-fearing and Christ-following. But that's the exception, not the rule. The percentages are way against that happening. And we thank God for those instances when it does, but don't count on it. There's an old saying that goes, behind every good man is a good woman, and a surprised mother-in-law. <laughs> Maybe that's true, but I would suggest that behind most godly men and women are godly parents and or grandparents who were themselves committed to Christ and who communicated their faith with their children. An example of this is found in Susanna Wesley. She had 19 children. Two of them were named Charles and John. Maybe you've heard of them. Charles and John Wesley were the founders of the Methodist Church. She homeschooled all of her children. And she taught a Bible study with over 200 in attendance. Among her rules for training her children were teach them to pray as soon as they can speak. As soon as a child can begin talking, you teach them how to pray. Because what is prayer? Talking with God. I'm always amused when somebody says, well, oh, I can't pray. Well, can you talk? <laughs> if you can talk, you can pray. Start young. By the time they were able to read and write, she was teaching them the scriptures, and literally the world was changed through the impact of her children. Same is true for Lois and Eunice. In addition to Timothy, who became a missionary with Paul and later the pastor of the prestigious Christian church in Ephesus, church history records that Lois's son, so this would have been Eunice's brother, Stratius, 
was the second bishop of the church at Smyrna, one of the seven churches that John wrote the book of Revelation to. So there was even more than Timothy coming out of that family that followed in the ministry and had an impact on people's lives for Christ. And I'm sure that his mother, Timothy's grandmother, had a big part in that, in bringing him up in the ways of the Lord. Think of the lives touched with the gospel of Christ by these two men. And try to imagine that happening without the influence of those two godly women. Now, not every mother or grandmother will have a missionary or a preacher come from their family, but all can have a significant impact on the young lives in their families. Anyone who's been born and bred in a Christian home has received from God a blessing beyond price. And I know I can say that for myself. I am so thankful that I had godly parents that from a very young age made sure that I was in church and they didn't just send me to church, they took me to church and were very involved. Uh, I know we're talking about mothers and Mother's Day and, and my mother did have a tremendous influence in my life. Uh, but I know my dad became a student of the word and more than anything, he developed that hunger to know God's word in me. I learned that from him. And it wasn't that he sat me down and said, no, I'm going to teach you to be a student of God's Word. No, he was a student, and I was so impressed by it, I wanted to be too. I am so thankful for the godly heritage that I was blessed with. I think there's one more element in the lives of Lois and Eunice that should be addressed, and, and I'm calling it their cooperation of faith. I already mentioned that for them, uh, coming from a Jewish background, to embrace Christianity would have been a costly thing. Probably they were disowned by their Jewish families and friends. I mentioned earlier from Acts 16 that Timothy's father was Greek. Now, the way you just read it in English, you know, his mother was Jewish, his father was Greek. It doesn't seem to be any difference. But the verb tense is very different. And John Stott believes that the verb tense here when it says his father was Greek, it's in the Greek imperfect tense, probably indicates that his father was no longer alive. His father had probably died somewhere along the way. Uh, even if that isn't the case, there's no indication that Timothy's father was ever a believer, that he ever came to faith in Christ. And if that's the case, whether literally or figuratively, Eunice was a single parent and that she bore the major responsibility for the spiritual nurture of her son, Timothy. And this example represents numerous families today. Now, there are an awful lot of literal single mothers in our culture and in our churches. But, you know, there are an awful lot of spiritual single mothers who may be married. The husband may very well be in the home, but he's checked out spiritually. He may want nothing to do with spiritual things. Or even if he comes to church, he thinks that that's a woman's responsibility and just puts it all on her. Many times you have single moms that are tasked with the responsibility of bringing their children to a saving knowledge of Christ. And that's tough. That's hard to do, especially if you have more than one child. Now, I do believe that the ideal situation is both mom and dad are involved in the upbringing of the children, that they should both um, work together, but that's not always possible. Sometimes the father is not physically present or is not emotionally or spiritually present. But I think that you still see how this can work. Eunice demonstrates that it is possible to bring up children in the training and instruction of the Lord, even though one parent is not a Christian. And this is where I see what I'm calling this cooperation in faith. The fact that Paul mentions both 
Eunice and Lois, her mother, in the training of Timothy tells me that they work together. Eunice didn't have her husband to help, but she did have her mother. And so Timothy's mother and grandmother work together to instill that godly heritage into that boy. And I think this shows a great opportunity for grandparents to play a role in the spiritual upbringing of their children. Grandparents have an opportunity for ministry to their grandchildren that their parents may not have time to do. Grandparents can be a prime channel of spiritual education, especially in homes of single parents or homes which both parents are there, but they're both working. And oftentimes, mom and dad need grandma and grandpa to help out in watching the kids while they're at work or until they get off work or um, just having those opportunities. Take those opportunities. If you're a grandparent and, and you have that access to your grandchildren, use it. Especially if they're one of those ages where grandma and grandpa are the coolest people on earth and mom and dad are just out, you know. <laughs> you know, you know how kids go through that stage. You know, mom and dad don't know nothing. But grandpa, he's the greatest. Oh, grandma, I can't wait to go to grandma's house. Use that. <laughs> use that enthusiasm. Use that openness and teach them the truth of God's Word. So on this Mother's Day, I, I present Lois and Eunice as example of mothers and grandmothers who pass on their faith to the next generation. They have a tremendous opportunity to impact the world for years to come, years after they're themselves long gone. To those like my own mother and grandmother who followed their example, uh, I want to say a heartfelt thank you on behalf of all of those who benefited from a godly heritage. You may never know in this life the impact you have. I do believe when we get to heaven we will. And that's going to be a great, great day of discovery. Some of you may be thinking, well, I really tried to bring up my children the right way, but when they grew up and set out on their own, they've gone their own way. So I guess I'm a failure as a parent. I don't believe that. We cannot judge our success by the results because the results are out of our hands. If that was the case, then God is a failure because Adam and Eve sinned. If we want to use that same line of thinking, then God failed when Adam and Eve sinned. Are you prepared to say that? I'm not. We do the best that we can, and in the end, they are going to have to make up their own mind. Lois and Eunice are models, not because Timothy turned out so well, but because they ministered so faithfully. Many a mother has been just as good and faithful as these two women, and yet suffered that pain of watching their children make wrong and harmful choices. And don't give up on your children, regardless of how old they might be, regardless of how far they may have strayed from the path you tried to lead them on. As long as they live, there is hope. There's numerous testimonies of men and women who have come to Christ later in life, after their parents have even gone on into eternity, and they're still being used mightily of God. So keep praying for them. Keep looking for opportunities that the Lord can use you to still influence their lives. Now, for those of you who have never considered the principles dealt with today, I just want to leave you with a challenge uh, from the late Charles Stanley. He writes, what are you leaving your children? If it's only money, forget it. That simply will not last for eternity. But what you plant in children's hearts, the spiritual truths that you sow into their lives, that's the real legacy you leave.
And believe me, they will appreciate it forever. I know I do. Would you bow with me as we close in prayer? Heavenly Father, we acknowledge that the family is your idea. You created the family before you created government, before you created schools or any other institution. You created the home, family. Moms and dads who have children and raise them. And we thank you that you have given us parents who sacrifice so much, who invest so much into our lives. And when we have children and grandchildren, you give us opportunities to invest in their lives. And I pray that you would give us wisdom to know how best we can do that. How we can impact generations to come through the lives of our children and our grandchildren, through the lives of young people who may look up to us, help us to see the opportunities and then make the most of them. And may our children and our grandchildren come to know you. May they love you and serve you and live for you. Because that is truly the best life they can have. Go with us now. Show us very practical ways that we can communicate, that we can instill the truth in their lives. And we pray this in Jesus' name.